disorders of water metabolism, both SIDH and uh, diabetes insipidus. And just to start out with some basics, uh, remember that ADH is ADP. They're the same thing. They're simply different names for the same thing. So don't be confused. The hormone is arginine vasopressin, but it's also called uh, antidiuretic hormone. So disorders of water metabolism, just like other endocrine diseases, diseases are either because you have too little hormone or too much hormone because if you have just the right amount, there is no disease. Too little hormone uh, results in diabetes insipidus and too much hormone results in SIDH and disorders that uh, also have elevated ADP like heart failure and cirrhosis. So we're gonna start out with hyponatremic disorders. And basically uh, one has to differentiate among these diagnoses. And we'll talk about that uh, because the treatment obviously is different uh, uh, depending on what the diagnosis is. Reason to start with hyponatremia and probably the bulk of this talk will be on hyponatremia with a little bit of DI at the end. Is this the most common electrolyte disorder you will be seeing? In this one-year study from Singapore of uh, 120,000 patients, 30% uh, of acute hospitalized patients were hyponatremic. And even in ambulatory hospital care and community care, incidences range between 7 and 21%. I get a printout every week of all patients in the MedStar Assist Health System with hyponatremia at Georgetown. Uh, they're always between 10 and 20 percent um, uh, of uh, patients in, uh, of our hospital beds have patients uh, with hyponatremia. So obviously, uh, all of you probably have one or more hyponatremic patients on your service at this time. But just a high incidence isn't sufficient reason to be concerned about hyponatremia. Uh, the reason to be concerned uh, is it's a marker of adverse outcomes. And this is the most adverse of outcomes in hospital mortality. And in this uh, electronic health record study from the Boston Teaching Hospital, uh, over a um, seven year period of time in 50,000 patients, you can see the obvious uh, increase in inpatient mortality with lower sodium levels. This is no surprise, we've known that for a long time. Um, but what this number of patients allows us to do is see this data with greater granularity. So most of you would agree or say that mortality is increased when sodium is less than 125. A few of you would say less than 130. No one would say mortality is increased between 130 and 134, but it is. Uh, and this study shows that. Remember, uh, associations, which this shows, do not mean causality. And I'm not saying that a sodium between 130 and 134 causes increased mortality. I'm saying it's associated with increased mortality it's a red flag, it's a marker of these patients having a worse outcome, so you ought to pay attention to it. Now, in terms of the diagnosis of hyponatremia, this is the algorithm that I use. Uh, many, of, any of you who have uh, been in this talk previously or seen, heard this talk previously have seen this. Uh, after you rule out hyperglycemia and pseudohyponatremia from increased lipids and protein, uh, which uh, you always should do, the real first step is determining the extracellular fluid volume status because the pathways and the treatments are different for hypovolemic, eubolemic, and hypervolemic patients. Not too hard to differentiate hypervolemic patients. Uh, ascites, uh, edema, and fluid overload is, is pretty clear in most cases. But this distinction between hypovolemic and eubolemic is more difficult. It's more difficult because unless there is uh, severe volume depletion, uh, these patients may not manifest the usual clinical symptoms uh, of hypovolemia. So in thinking about this and, and how you make that determination, um, I like to keep things simple. Endocrinologists uh, like to simplify things. I like to say nephrologists like to complicate things, uh, but uh, we keep it simple. So the body is a beaker two-thirds full of water divided between the intracellular, extracellular compartments, beverage of choice coming in, the kidney is a smart spigot to let fluid out. In that construct, you can only become hyponatremic two ways. One is to become depleted of solute, both sodium uh, and potassium, either in the urine as naturesis or through the skin as sweat, the GI tract uh, as vomiting and, and diarrhea. Uh, obviously, this produces a volume depleted state, so the patients are solute depleted and volume depleted. On the other hand, a dilutional hyponatremia is very different. It's caused by the spigot being uh, turned too tight by ADP. Uh, that impairs free water excretion. There's a backup of free water uh, shown in the yellow bar, and that dilutes uh, 
the sodium and the extracellular compartment, and potassium intracellular. Treatment for these two conditions is diametrically opposed. These patients need solute and volume repletion, usually as isotonic saline. These patients will not respond well to that. You may make their hyponatremia worse. They need removal of excess water, either via fluid restriction or more active therapies that we'll talk about. So if you don't make the, wrong, the right diagnosis right off the start, you are destined to use the wrong therapy for these patients. Therefore, it's essential that you know how to make this uh, distinction. And the way to make that distinction is a very simple test, uh, which is never obtained in the ER when the patients are first seen. Uh, so it's up to you when they hit the floor to get the, uh, the right test. And that's a spot urine sodium. The spot urine sodium will be the best differentiator of the volume status of the patient, assuming they're not on diuretics at the time, which is obviously a confound. Uh, and that was first uh, nicely shown in this study uh, back in 1987. 100 patients presented to the University of Colorado with uh, hyponatremia. Uh, the best nephrologists, uh, um, some of the best in the country, uh, Bob Schreier, Tom Burrell, some of those names you know, um, evaluated them with regard to their volume status clinically with a hypoglemic, euglemic. But then regardless of what they decided, they all got the same treatment. They all were infused with isotonic saline. Some responded by increasing their sodium, some didn't. And when we looked, when they looked at the clinical uh, determination, it turns out that the clinicians and nephrologists were right 50% of the time. The bad news is they were wrong 50% of the time. So you examining a patient, you're only going to be right about the volume status um, about 50% of the time. But the spot urine sodium was right about 90% of the time. So if the urine sodium was less than 30, um, all those patients responded to isotonic saline. If it was greater than about 35, uh, the majority did not respond. These have SIDH, these were volume depleted. So I take that uh, as a cutoff for determination of whether the patient is hypovolemic or euglemic. You should always get a spot urine sodium. You don't need a phena, uh, you just need a spot urine sodium. <coughs> and you should think, uh, why does that work? I mean, why is that a good determination? It is because the patient's kidney is in a better position to determine whether it's underperfused uh, than you are um, external to the patient. And so if the patient's kidney feels it's underperfused, it's going to put in motion uh, mechanisms, both intrarenal and extrarenal, to conserve sodium. So the urine sodium will be low. Uh, if the patient, uh, patient's kidney thinks the patient is euvolemic, good perfusion of the kidney, there's no reason to save sodium. So the sodium will be excreted to keep in balance with whatever sodium is coming in. Uh, trust the patient's kidney uh, in addition to your clinical exam. So you need to make a diagnosis of SIDH uh, because it's, uh, it's got uh, different treatments in hypovolemia, obviously. And these are the criteria that we've known for the last uh, 50 years, really. Uh, get up piosm to make sure they're really hypo or smaller. Any uosm greater than 100 is inappropriate unless the patient is, is old or has decreased renal function. They have to be clinically blemic, not on diuretics. Absent sodium conservation, again, urine sodium spot greater than 30, normal thyroid, uh, uh, adrenal, and renal function. Those are the tests you have to get. Now, on this list is not the plasma AVP level. And you might ask why, why not? Because SIDH means inappropriate ADH or AVP levels. Uh, and here you see that data, uh, a series of patients with SIDH and orange dots. Um, and these are inappropriate AVP levels for a low plasma osmolality, less than 275. Notice that they aren't all high levels, some are, but most aren't. These are normal, uh, so-called normal AVP levels. All of you probably have an ADP level between one and five right now, depending upon uh, what you've drunk recently. Uh, so they're not high, they're inappropriate. Um, but some are very low, almost unmeasurable. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why ADP is not used as a criterion for SIDH. Uh, but a more important reason is these levels can be elevated uh, either because of SIDH, say from a small cell cancer of the lung, uh, or because the patient is hypovolemic, because hypovolemia is a stimulus to AVP to conserve water via baroreceptor activation. So AVP, uh, as well as the new player on the block, the peptin that some of you have heard about, 
a surrogate for AVP secretion. Uh, they are elevated whether you're hypovolemic or have SIDH, and therefore there is no differential diagnostic value of getting an AVP level uh, in patients with hyponatremia. You don't need to do that. Uh, the reason that AVP levels can be low and you can still have SIDH is shown in this cartoon uh, or figure, which relates plasma osmolality to plasma AVP and urine osmolality. So as you become dehydrated, P osmo goes up, AVP goes up, and the urine becomes more concentrated up to a max of 1,000. Uh, but the urine volume is not linear like these relationships are. It's uh, inverse and it's exponential. So urine volume increases exponentially as the AVP levels and the uosin get lower. Uh, and so what that means is that normally the kidney can excrete up to 1,000 mLs an hour between 700 and 1,000. Uh, if you only have an AVP level that's at the detection limits of 0.5 picograms per mL, you have the ability to excrete through water. And if you only have one picogram per mL, your ability to excrete water is now only 25% of normal. So the bottom line of what this shows you is the kidney is exquisitely sensitive to AVP. And therefore, low AVP levels, yeah, they're consistent with SIDH, uh, just as high, high AVP levels are consistent with SIDH. Don't bother measuring it. Now, as you go down this algorithm, uh, even before you get to this differential diagnosis uh, of whether the patient really has SIDH, you see these big red arrows. These big red arrows uh, obviously are there to catch your attention. Uh, and that means you immediately evaluate neurological symptoms even before you know exactly what the patient has in terms of a diagnosis. And the reason for that is acute hyponatremia uh, has very bad outcomes. In this single hospital uh, uh, study from San Francisco, these patients had uh, hyponatremia for less than 12 hours, 112, and they didn't do well. 100% coma, 30% seizures, and between 30 and 50% died. That's a bad disease. And we know why that is, because the patients have brain edema uh, uh, as a result of water movement into the brain. This is a normal brain with uh, uh, CSF spatial in black on the CT scan. Uh, and this is an edematous brain of a hyponatremic patient. Uh, the ventricles are slits, the sulci are uh, effaced. And at this point, this brain has nowhere to go because it hit the wall and the wall is the skull. And as a result, uh, the only place to go is down, and that's when you get herniation through the tentorium and the foramen magnum, uh, compression of brainstem respiratory centers and, and death. But even if you catch the patient ahead of time, intubate them, patients still won't do well because they will have, be brain dead because of uh, uh, brain ischemia as a result uh, of the blood vessels being compressed by the brain edema. So this is an example of um, how uh, and when that can occur. Uh, it occurs uh, occasionally at the end of marathons, ultramarathons, triathlons, uh, as seen in this uh, uh, healthy young man who was a fitness instructor who died at the finish line of the London Marathon uh, in 2007. Uh, and if you read the description on the internet here, uh, he died of hyponatremia and a fatal swelling of the brain. Why did he die? Uh, he died because he drank too much Lucozade, which is the British equivalent of uh, Gatorade, uh, during the race, suppressed his sodium to 122 millimoles per liter uh, and uh, experienced the brain edema that I showed you on the previous CT scan. So, you know, you see a lot of patients on your service that have a sodium less than 122, uh, and they're not about to die because of brain edema. Uh, but what this tells you is that 122, somewhere between 120 and 125, is an emergency situation if it's an acute hyponatremia. Now, Chronic hyponatremia uh, is different. So in the same hospital, these patients uh, were hyponatremic for more than three days, had a severe hyponatremia less than 120, but look at their symptoms, 6% uh, coma, 4% seizure, really no mortality from the hyponatremia. It looks like a different disease uh, because in fact, it is a different disease uh, at a different time point in the disease. So what you need to understand to understand why hyponatremia can present so differently across different patients, uh, which you see all the time uh, in the hospital, is that uh, as you go from a normal state to an acute hyponatremic state, regardless of whether it's due to sodium loss or water gain, uh, the law of osmosis, and you can't deny the law of osmosis, uh, will cause water movement to move into water to move into the more concentrated compartment. Uh, 
which is inside the brain rather than the extracellular fluid. As a result, you get brain edema, cerebral edema shown in the dotted line. If that exceeds a, a level of about 8 to 12 percent, uh, the patient uh, will have herniation and probably die from that. But the brain is very good at adapting to hyponatremia. Uh, within, um, certainly within hours, um, maybe minutes, but certainly within hours, the brain begins to lose solute. It loses electrolytes, it loses osmolites. As it loses the solute, it loses the water, and the brain edema uh, is no longer present. So with chronic hyponatremia, uh, the brain does not have any edema, uh, and therefore the patient is not at risk of herniation. So of all the patients, the 10 to 20 percent with hyponatremia in Georgetown Hospital right now, uh, I would wager that none of them have any degree of brain edema uh, because they're probably all of this chronic hyponatremia, uh, this chronic hyponatremia as opposed to acute. Uh, now, how long, you should ask, does it take to go from this state to that state? And we know from good studies in animals and, and uh, um, not quite so good, but convincing studies in humans, that this takes between 24 and 48 hours. So that's why we define an acute hyponatremia today as a hyponatremia of less than 40 hours of duration versus a chronic one is one of more than 48 hours duration. Now, you might think that because there's no more brain edema, then this patient should be asymptomatic, but that's not the case. It's not a normal brain, even when you have chronic hyponatremia, because what it takes to go from this state to that state is loss of up to 15 to 20 percent of brain solute, some of which are important neurotransmitters. So just remember, the patient may not have brain edema, um, may not be imminently about to die, but does have symptoms, it's not a normal brain. Now, how do you determine whether a patient has acute or chronic hyponatremia? Uh, because usually the patient can't tell you and usually the family can't tell you. Uh, so this is how you tell. These are the symptoms of hyponatremia. They're basically all neurological. Uh, if you see these symptoms, stupor, coma, convulsions, respiratory arrest, or anything resembling them, those are, of course, life-threatening, and usually they mean the patient does have brain edema and it's an acute hyponatremia. On the other hand, if the patient has any of these symptoms, ranging from non-specific ones like headache and irritability uh, to more specific ones like unstable gait, confusion, and disorientation, yes, the, those are symptomatic. Uh, those are symptoms the patient's symptomatic, but they're less impaired, and usually that means the brain has already adapted to the hyponatremia and it means it's a chronic uh, uh, hyponatremia. So since you don't always know the duration, uh, but you can always do a careful neurological exam, then you can use the degree of symptomatology as a surrogate for the duration of hyponatremia. You see those symptoms, you treat as acute hyponatremia. You see those symptoms, uh, you can treat uh, in a more measured fashion, uh, as we'll go into shortly. Uh, and in treating these patients, it's not so simple uh, as just immediately correcting the hyponatremia, uh, because I think all of you know by now, you certainly should, uh, that if you correct the hyponatremia too quickly, you can develop uh, this syndrome, extrapontine ponti and extrapontine myelolysis. Now we call it osmotic demyelination syndrome, uh, uh, which leads in its most severe state to quadriplegia, quadriplegia uh, and uh, cranial nerve palsies and a locked-in syndrome in which the patient is conscious but can't move any muscles uh, anywhere in their body. This is caused by demyelination of motor neurons uh, in the central pons and midbrain because that, those uh, neurons that course through there uh, comprise the cortical bulbar and cortical spinal tracts. That's why you get paralysis uh, uh, everywhere uh, with full-blown osmotic demyelination. So as we talk about treatments, uh, which is going to come next, you need to remember that treatment of hyponatremia represents a balance. It's a balance between the risk of hyponatremia and the risk of correction. So this may be three different patients, all of whom have the same sodium of 115 millimoles per liter. But if this is an acute hyponatremia, there's brain edema, minimal brain volume regulation, and therefore the risk of hyponatremia far outweigh any risk of correction. On the other hand, the same sodium level in a patient with chronic hyponatremia uh, is, a man, is a patient who doesn't have many symptoms or much risk from the hyponatremia itself, and therefore the risk of correction and osmotic demyelination are greater than the risk of the hyponatremia itself. Uh, 
Um, however, there are patients, uh, and you see them with chronic symptomatic uh, hyponatremia. It means there may be a brain edema, uh, but there is partial brain volume regulation. And there, there's um, uh, some balance between the risk of hyponatremia risk of correction. So you have to correct within guideline limits to make sure that you don't uh, uh, cause either of these uh, adverse outcomes of the hyponatremia. So what are our treatments? We have a fair number of treatments that have been uh, used over the years and are used. Short-term treatments, either isotonic or hypertonic saline, but we also have two different vasopressin antagonists, condobaptin and cobaptin. Long-term fluid restriction has been treatment of choice, but I'll show you uh, data with, uh, for how that really, uh, how much that really works. Uh, Demeclocyping not used very much anymore. Nephrologists like salt tabs and furosemide, but um, uh, they have a limited efficacy. Uh, Japanese like mineralocorticoids, uh, but in most patients, they don't work well. Uh, and urea has become a more popular treatment, and we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Uh, and then for long-term treatment, we have the oral baptin, tobaptin, conobaptin as IV can only be given in a hospital setting. So how do you decide which of these treatments to use and when to use them? Uh, I would base it on their neurological symptoms. And basically, you can divide uh, patients into three groups. With any disease, you can always divide severity into three groups, severe, moderate, and mild. Uh, so for severe symptoms, coma, obtundation, seizures, respiratory distress, vomiting, the choice is easy because there is no choice. All these patients should get hypertonic saline, followed uh, by other therapy to, uh, to uh, uh, maintain the uh, sodium in a more normal range. The reason for that is the only treatment that is absolutely guaranteed to get the sodium up within minutes of administration uh, and therefore decrease brain edema and intracranial pressure is hypertonic saline. And hypertonic mannitol will do that too, um, but it's more problematic to treat with hypertonic mannitol because you'll actually be decreasing the sodium as you increase the osmolality. So hypertonic saline is the preferred uh, treatment. How do you give it? You know, mostly we've been giving it as continuous infusion. Uh, in the simplest way uh, to estimate the correction rate is to multiply the patient's weight in kilos times your, times your desired correction rate, so one milliequivalent per liter per hour, and infuse that as 3% sodium chloride. 70 kilograms, you want to correct that one per hour, you start at 70 mLs per hour. That is very difficult to do in Georgetown Hospital because our pharmacy is paranoid of uh, using hypertonic saline through a peripheral line because of fear of uh, um, infusion site reactions and phlebitis, which have never been documented. Uh, and really, there is no evidence-based data to support that, but they are. So when we've tried to give um, infusion rates approximating this, uh, in the ER, we have to do two separate peripheral lines and infuse each with 30 mLs per hour, which I think is stupid, but that's, uh, that's uh, where our hospital is at present. However. Um, as I showed you on one of the previous slides, we also are, um, we, I, along with others, uh, have been involved with um, treatment of uh, athletes and uh, amateurs uh, at the finish line of endurance events like marathons, ultra marathons. You know, the medical tent, if any of you have been in it at the finish line of a marathon, is just that it's a tent, it's a grass floor with cuts. There are no infusion pumps uh, to start. So we had to devise a method that could be used in the field, and this is what we do. We do this now at uh, finish lines of sanctioned marathons. If a patient is symptomatically hyponatremic, they get a 100 ml bolus infusion of 3% sodium chloride over five to 10 minutes, um, and then it's repeated every 30 minutes uh, until the goal is reached, and the goal is generally correction of sodium at least five millimoles per liter, uh, and that's checked on site with a nice step to a sodium check. Uh, for all corrections, follow the sodium and urine output every two to four hours. But if you're using boluses, uh, then uh, every 30, minute, if you, 30 minutes if you're using boluses. Now, we have recommended this method of infusion as part of our hyponatremia guidelines in 2013. Um, based on our uh, experience with field treatment uh, uh, using boluses. Uh, however, recently, uh, controlled studies have verified the efficacy of this approach. And this is why I'm showing it to you because this is not something that can be used or should be used just at the finish line in the medical tent of marathons. This is a study from Ireland 
looking at the efficacy of 100 ml boluses of hypertonic saline shown in the red versus continuous infusion, in this case, 50 ml per hour of 3% saline shown in the blue. And as you would predict, the boluses achieved an increase in serum sodium more quickly than did the continuous infusion, uh, such that the goal of about eight uh, millimoles per liter increase was reached in six to 12 hours, uh, as opposed to taking up to 24 hours for the infusion. Uh, at the end of 24 hours, they're all the same, but you got there more quickly. And was that beneficial? Well, in these patients, it was, because these were all uh, neurologic patients in the neuro ICU with a Glasgow coma score of uh, 12 or less. Uh, and you can see that the patients who got the boluses uh, had a quicker resolution of their symptoms and a uh, quicker improvement of the Glasgow coma score uh, than the infused patients, even though they all got to the same point in 24 hours. So we are recommending a uh, bolus infusion uh, when you can use it uh, as the treatment for very symptomatic uh, hyponatremia uh, neurologically in order to get them out of trouble more quickly, uh, but still not overly rapidly correct them uh, at 24 hours. So that's acute. What about that's uh, severe symptomatic? What about more moderate symptoms? Altered mental status, disorientation, confusion, unexplained nausea, gait, instability. There you have more time. You can use a limited hypertonic saline um, bolus or infusion, but you don't need to because these are not life-threatening type symptoms. And your treatment should be based on the volume status of the patient. If they're hypovolemic, you want to soluble replete them usually with isotonic uh, uh, um, saline uh, or oral sodium if they're able to take that. If they're euvolemic, you can use hypertonic saline, but you can also use abaptin or urea if you can access it in the hospital followed by fluid restriction. And if they are hypervolemic with heart failure, um, cardiologists aren't going to like you using hypertonic saline. Uh, so we would recommend the Baptin as the best treatment if they have symptoms uh, and have a hypervolemic uh, hyponatremia. So let's look at uh, some of the treatment options. Uh, Baptin's vasopressin receptor antagonist, the, the main one we use is Covaptin, uh, work by blocking the binding of AVP to the V2 receptor in the kidney. This is the collecting duct cell. Uh, that prevents activation of uh, uh, intracellular pathways that result in insertion of these aquaporin-2 water channels in the apical membrane, which is the membrane uh, that, that uh, is sitting uh, uh, next to the urine in the collecting duct. So you're preventing resorption of water, uh, and therefore what you get is an increased urine output. You know, we can call that a diuresis because there is increased uh, excretion of urine, but classically and historically, we've referred to diuretic agents uh, as those that increase water and solute ex excretion. Um, because after all, you use pyrosamide and other loop diuretics more to get rid of sodium than you do to get rid of water. These agents have no effect on sodium or other electrolyte excretion. Uh, they purely increase water excretion without increased solute. And therefore, we'd prefer that you call them acaretic agents. And what they produce is an acaresis or a water diuresis. Uh, free water diuresis rather than uh, a solute and water diuresis. This is what you see with tovaptin uh, from the phase three uh, salt studies. Uh, all patients started less than 130. Uh, these were given tovaptin. Oops, let me go back. These were given tovaptin. These were given placebo. You see the obvious difference correction of sodium on tovaptin, not much change with placebo. Uh, and this is a, a logarithmic scale. So Actually, most of the correction occurred within four days and then was maintained for 30 days. If the drug was stopped, sodium fell back down to low levels. So uh, duration is at least 30 days. But in fact, in the open label study, we took patients out to four years and they maintained a normal sodium until the tovaptin was stopped, in which case they became hyponatremic again. Who does this work in? Certainly works in SIDH. Green is tovaptin, yellow is uh, placebo. Uh, mean correction of about seven to eight millimoles per liter after 30 days. Also works in heart failure because the hyponatremia of heart failure is due to baroreceptor stimulated AVP secretion. Works less well in cirrhosis though it does work significantly, but it's now contraindicated in cirrhosis or severe liver failure because of some hepatotoxicity that only occurs at high doses of tovaptin, but the FDA is being cautious about this, so you should not use it 
uh, in that group of patients. Now, what about urea, uh, since it's becoming more popular? You have to understand why urea works. Once you give urea, you don't change the serum sodium acutely. That's why it's not an acute therapy for hyponatremia. In fact, you increase the plasma osmolality. You don't really increase the sodium until you excrete the urea. And once you excrete the urea, you have an osmotic diuresis, and an osmotic diuresis carries water along with the urea. It's the same as the type of solute diuresis that you get with uncontrolled hyperglycemia and diabetics uh, and glucosuria. They get dehydrated, as you know, uh, because of this uh, osmotic diuresis uh, that carries water with it. Uh, so basically 500 millimoles of os uh, urea uh, cause excretion of one liter of free water, more or less, on average, and that's why you get the correction. Now, <clears throat> I know that residents uh, love to use salt tablets for hyponatremia. Um, if you get an endocrine consult and I'm the attending, um, you won't find such love for uh, salt tablets uh, because I'll show you in a bit, in most patients, they don't work. Uh, but you have to understand one thing about salt tablets. Salt tablets don't work in SIDH because patients with SIDH are not sodium depleted. Uh, they're not hypovolemic, so you're not replacing lost sodium. The only way they work is the same way urea works, is they cause an osmotic diuresis, so that as you excrete more sodium in the urine, it carries water with it. So how much do you need in terms of salt tablets to achieve that goal? Urea, 30 grams is a 500 milliosomes. For salt tablets, one gram is 34 milliosomes. So this gets you one liter of excess water output. How many salt tablets do you need in order to achieve the same thing? You can do the math, it's pretty simple. 500 divided by 34, 15 grams of sodium chloride. No one of you, I would bet, has ever um, prescribed the patient to get 15 grams a day of salt tablets. You're just not gonna do that because that's way too much sodium chloride. But that's how much you really need to get an effective osmotic diuresis. Yes, you can use less uh, if you couple it with a loop diuretic such as Lasix. Uh, you might be able to get away with uh, six to nine grams, uh, but the typical thing we see being used is, you know, one gram BID or even one gram a day. That's homeopathic. That's not going to do anything. So you're going to use salt tablets to use enough uh, to get this osmotic diuresis, but uh, I would prefer to use urea. Uh, over salt tablets if that's what your goal is for correction. So what's data about what actually works and doesn't work? So we did a hyponatremia registry, a retrospective study uh, in 300 hospitals in the US and the EU, including Georgetown. Um, and uh, we looked at patients with a clinical diagnosis of SIDH uh, and different treatments, no treatment, fluid restriction, isotonic saline, cobaptin, um, hypertonic saline. And our minimal criteria for success was an increased sodium at least equal or greater to five millimoles per liter. So how many of these treatments achieve that? Um, fluid restriction, less than 50% effect, not much better than no treatment at all. Isotonic saline, even worse, as I uh, told you it was, uh, of only 36%. And the only two treatments that had a significantly uh, high success rate with tilbaptin um, and uh, uh, hypertonic saline. So if you're going to treat and you want to be sure you're getting the hyponatremia corrected, uh, I would recommend you use the most effective therapies uh, and they are tilbaptin and hypertonic saline. Urea is not on this slide because at the time we did this, this study, there weren't enough inpatients. So getting urea to uh, constitute a treatment group that, that we can look at. So I can't tell you success rate of urea from, from this particular study. Uh, but the, the, the flip side of which treatments are effective uh, is which treatments are too effective, and too effective means that you may set the patient up for osmotic demyelination syndrome. So in our guidelines, we published in 2013, you can freely download those from the American Journal of Medicine. We divide patients into three risk categories. Uh, on this side is acute water intoxication. Those are the patients with hyponatremia less than 48 hours duration. Uh, it may be at the end of, an, uh, of a marathon, maybe just an acute water intoxication. It may be a post-op patient that gets infused with too much fluids intraoperatively. For those patients, there is no real risk of osmotic de demyelination. Uh, 
uh, because the brain has volume regulated and therefore the brain has not yet volume regulated and therefore they're not at risk of osmotic myelination. So there's no limit. You can, you can correct them all the way to normal. You don't need to uh, observe any limit in terms of maximum correction rate. Uh, however, most of your patients in the hospital are going to be in this group, low to moderate risk. Those are patients with chronic hyponatremia. There, your limit should be somewhere between 10 and 12 millimoles per liter per day. The reason that's a bar and not a line uh, is that most studies would say 12 is safe. Uh, a few studies have shown osmotic myelination with correction of between 10 and 12. So if you want to be more cautious, take 10 as your upper limit. Uh, but importantly, your goal should be less than your limit, because if your goal is your limit, you're bound to overcorrect. So your goal should be somewhere between four and eight. Uh, my goal is between six and eight uh, for most patients with symptoms. Now, what if you accidentally overshoot the correction? Should you re-lower the sodium by giving the patient water with or without desmopressin? Uh, at the time we wrote this, we thought it was optional because there wasn't enough evidence-based data. Now I think there is that it's a good idea, and I would recommend that you do that. But the patients you really have to worry about are these with high-risk osmotic delamination syndrome. Uh, and in those patients, uh, no more than 8 millimoles per liter uh, in any 24-hour period. Your goal should be commensurately lower between 4 and 6. And should you overshoot, uh, re-lowering is, uh, in this case, it was recommended. I would say uh, it's mandatory now that you re-lower the sodium back uh, to that correction of 8. And who are those patients? Those are patients with very severe hyponatremia, less than 105, any degree of hypokalemia, alcoholism, malnutrition, advanced liver disease. If you see any of those characteristics, you should be more conservative and make sure your correction does not exceed eight in any 24-hour period. Now, how many patients actually get um, uh, osmotic demyelination syndrome? So this was a very informative study from Geisinger, hospital system in Central Pennsylvania that uh, came out in 2018. Uh, they retrospectively looked at about 1,500 patients with severe hyponatremia, less than 120. And they looked at how many had, had an overly rapid correction, and it was a lot. They defined overly rapid as more than 8 millimoles per liter for 24 hours, and 41% of those patients did. So if that alone was a risk factor for osmotic demyelination, you would say a good number of those patients should have gotten osmotic demyelination, but they didn't. The number who did was eight, confirmed by MRI, uh, or only 0.5% of those who had that uh, correction greater than eight. Uh, and if you look at who those were, five of them had alcoholism, five of them were hypokalemic, and seven just had the overly rapid correction. Uh, so uh, the fact is that corrections above eight occur frequently, uh, but rarely do you get osmotic denomination uh, unless the patient has other risk factors for osmotic denomination. So those are the patients you need to be especially cautious about. Finally, what about this group? No or minimal symptoms. You can't even tell whether these symptoms are really from the hyponatremia or something else. Can't concentrate, depression, unexplained headaches, so what do you do? Uh, all of them should begin with a trial of fluid restriction uh, as the simplest uh, uh, therapy uh, to try to see if you can increase the serum sodium. But you should do it intelligently. And what does intelligently mean? It means you should recognize not only how to do a fluid restriction, that's, that's up uh, above, but I think you all know that, uh, but you need to also take into account the predictors of likely failure of fluid restriction. Uh, and there are four that, that we specify in our guidelines. High you awesome greater than 500 because you need some urine-free water excretion uh, to make a fluid restriction work. If you're, if you're concentrated this much, there's virtually little free water coming out in the kidney. Very tough to put that patient in a negative water balance, which you need to, to increase the sodium. Secondly, the sum of urine sodium and potassium exceeds the serum sodium. Uh, that's the urine to plasma electrolyte ratio. And the reason that's a predictor is it's not only uh, free water that needs to be uh, excreted uh, in the urine, it's electrolyte free water uh, in order to have a correction of sodium. And I'll show you that on the next slide. If your 24 hour urine, if you have one is less than 1500, you're likely going to fail because fluid restrictions generally uh, need to be 500 mLs below the 24 hour uh, urine output, and that puts you at less than a liter a day. 
uh, which is tough to maintain uh, in inpatients as well as outpatients. And finally, if you do try it, but the increase in serum sodium is less than two uh, in 24 to 48 hours and on a fluid restriction of less than one liter per day, you're likely gonna fail in the long run. So you should move on to more effective therapies. So the fluid, uh, the urine to the plasma electrolyte ratio, also called the first equation because of the first author, uh, that isn't even a good pun of this paper. Uh, and if you're the sum of the urine sodium and potassium, spot urine sodium and potassium, divided by the serum sodium is one or greater, the fluid restriction you would need to correct the sodium is a zero ml. And I think you know that's kind of hard to achieve uh, in patients. Uh, and even if it's in this range, 0.5 to 1, you need a severe fluid restriction, 500 to 800 mLs, which again, you can do short term, it's hard to do long term. Only when that ratio is less than five can you get away with the typical fluid restriction that you all use, one to 1.2 or maybe even 1.5 liters a day. Uh, that will not work unless this ratio is in this particular range. So that's um, based on theoretical constructs. What about real life data? So in last year, there was the first randomized controlled trial, the first one ever of fluid restriction versus no therapy. It was done in Dublin, Ireland by um, a group that, uh, that are good friends of mine. Uh, and this is what the results were. A uh, small number of patients, uh, um, about uh, 29, I think, in each group. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see what happened to these patients. Fluid restriction did work. It increased the serum sodium uh, over no treatment significantly at most time points, except this one 18 days, not clear why. But look at the effect size. This was not a big increase in serum sodium. So the median increase was four versus one in the no treatment group. You, you subtract one from four. The effect size of the fluid restriction is three millimoles per liter. That's about what you get. Uh, and the increase in sodium of five or more, my criteria for a successful treatment, uh, was only 17% in fluid restriction versus 4% without treatment. Again, effect size of 13%. Uh, and finally, to get over 130, 61% uh, of fluid restriction, but 40% of no treatment, again, only in a fifth of patients. So fluid restriction can work, but use it intelligently in those patients who you predict it will work uh, and not in those patients uh, uh, who won't. So of all these uh, situations where fluid restriction probably is not the best choice, top on the list is inability to tolerate the fluid restriction because of thirst or predicted fire fluid restriction based on the career, uh, criteria that uh, I shared you um, uh, previously. So use it first, uh, but use it intelligently. And don't keep on using it if it doesn't work uh, for, within 24 to 48 hours, uh, because all the data, uh, including this data that I just showed you from the Irish group, uh, all of the correction was in the first couple of days. Nothing happened between days four and 30 that didn't happen within day four. Uh, and usually you'll see it within one to two days if you're really going to have a response to uh, fluid restriction. So um, I see I've got like eight minutes left. Uh, maybe, uh, to cover um, uh, DI. Uh, these are the things that can cause um, uh, polyuria or increase, a decreased ADP effect uh, in the kidney, uh, but they include uh, this ringer of primary polydipsia. I'll show you some new data on this. Importantly, uh, neurogenic or central DI uh, is generally not caused by things that are uh, pituitary lesions. So you know, we see this lesion a lot. There's a pituitary macroadenoma. It's growing out of the cella. That will never cause DI uh, until the neurosurgeon gets in there and mucks things up and you have postoperative DI. The reason that won't cause DI is you need to remember the posterior pituitary is very different from the anterior pituitary. In the anterior pituitary, the hormones are made in the anterior pituitary and they're secreted from the anterior pituitary. Not true of the posterior pituitary. The hormone ABP is made in the hypothalamus uh, above the pituitary and then is transported down neuronal axons into the posterior pituitary where it's released. So you can destroy the posterior pituitary, that lesion I just showed you did, but if these, neuro if these uh, neurons stay intact, you can still secrete ADP from higher up, which is why those patients don't present with diabetes insipidus. Posterior pituitary is also unique because you can visualize it it's visualized by this 
bright spot on a non-contrast uh, sagittal MRI image. You can see it a little better here. Uh, that bright spot tells you there is AVP neurosecretory granules within the posterior pituitary. Uh, so you can use that as a, as a marker of whether in fact you have intact AVP secretion. Problem is it's, it's not that specific. Uh, older people, people with dehydration, lose the bright spot as the AVP is secreted. Uh, and so you can't use the presence or absence of a bright spot to either totally rule in or rule out diabetes insipidus, uh, though it is uh, a useful adjunct and, and we do look at it uh, and uh, get a brain MRI in patients with new onset of diabetes insipidus. In terms of what causes diabetes insipidus, other than trauma from neurosurgery or uh, head, head trauma, uh, this is a series of pediatric patients but it's pretty much true of adults as well. Tumors, about 20%. Genetic, about 5%. Uh, inflammatory uh, granulomatous disease, Langerhans in kids, um, sarcoid in, in adults, uh, close to 20%. But look at this column here, 54% idiopathic. And you know what idiopathic means. It means we don't understand what causes it. Um, and so I'll show you now that we do know what causes it, actually. So here's an example of Langerhans. And the way you pick these up is not by the bright spot. You pick it up by pituitary stock thickening because that's where the granulomatous inflammation generally occurs. So uh, early on, 10 months, you see a marked thickening of the pituitary stock. But after two years, when the AVP neurons and axons are destroyed, uh, the stock comes back to normal size. So you can only use this uh, more acutely with the acute onset of the DI symptoms uh, rather than chronic DI. So what causes it idiopathically? A seminal study from Japan in 1993 where they biopsied the pituitary stock uh, that was thickened uh, in this idiopathic case, and they found these uh, 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 T lymphocytes uh, uh, by immuno immunological staining. And so what this is, is a immunological destruction of the uh, neurons that make AVP. And because of that, we call it lymphocytic because of the lymphocyte infiltration. Infundibular neurohypothesitis because it involves the infundibulum, which is at the base of the brain, and the neurohypothesis, and it's an inflammation, so it's situs. So that's a pretty long name to remember. Uh, we generally uh, abbreviate it by L-I-N. Uh, and what does it look like when you see it? Uh, it looks like this, a bulbous thickening of the pituitary stock. Uh, and uh, that's not a patient who we do neurosurgery on. We simply follow them uh, over time to see if the DI resolves or becomes complete. Nephrogenic DI, uh, if it's familial, uh, it's generally X-linked uh, receptive, recessive, so it occurs in, in males because of these mutations of the uh, V2 receptor. Uh, when you see it in your patients, it's generally hypercalcemia or hypokalemia, uh, or because of lithium as acquired DI. Remember, these have to be severe. You don't see this with a calcium of 11 or, or 12. It has to be over 13 and the hypokalemia has to be severe as well. But you can see it with even uh, lithium concentrations in therapeutic uh, uh, ranges. Primary polydipsia, we're not gonna have time to talk about, uh, but I do wanna show you uh, the new data on that. Uh, our way to diagnose, um, differentiate primary polydipsia from DI was to do a water deprivation test, starting with outpatient uh, overnight, and then if that was not diagnostic, uh, an inpatient water deprivation. Uh, and what we're looking for is this, uh, as opposed to a normal response with increased urinosome, people with complete central DI, no response, but then they do respond when you give them DDAVP. Nephrogenic DI, no concentration, no response to DDAVP. But if you look at primary polydipsia, partial central DI, the overlap is great, uh, and it made differential diagnosis difficult. Even when we use AVP levels, uh, sometimes you can use an AVP level to diagnose DI uh, because it's low and the patient is hyperosmolar, uh, whereas a nephrogenic DAVP is uh, high and elevated. Uh, but the overlap, again, is substantial if you're in the normal range. So the newest development in this field uh, was done by a group from Switzerland, uh, uh, Miriam Chris Crane, uh, and they had this paper in the New England Journal, uh, which looked at a hypertonic saline infusion test 250 bolus of 3%, followed by this infusion rate to get to a sodium 150. And they measured not AVP, but copeptin. 
Copeptin is part of the AVP prohormone. It's more stable and therefore it's easier to assay. Uh, and uh, you can get this uh, on order from uh, both Quest and the Mayo Clinic labs. I recommend Mayo Clinic because they use the methodology that the Swiss group reported. But what you need to look at is the results. So looking at the same patient's water deprivation, too much overlap between DI and primary polydipsia with a hypertonic saline infusion, the copeptin level clearly stimulated higher uh, in patients with primary polydipsia than DI. Uh, so this is a good way, and it is, how, it is not how we will be using it everywhere because at Georgetown Hospital, uh, the pharmacy would never give approval to infuse hypertonic saline at that rate uh, through a peripheral line, uh, again, for reasons that um, I alluded to. So the same group has come out with a, another test, which is an arginine stimulation test. Uh, and again, arginine, for reasons that I don't think anyone understands, will cause an elevation of copeptin greater than patients of DI. Uh, so this is what you'll see us using in the future to differentiate primary polydipsia from true uh, partial or central DI. Um, Diabetes insipidus treatment, we don't need to look at this very long. We forget PUP there. We know that DDAVP is the treatment of choice. These two uh, Ds, the D amino group and the D arginine, uh, extend the half life of DDAVP versus AVP, and they make it specific for the B2 receptor rather than the D1 receptor on vascular epithelium. The one thing I want you to remember is the dosing that. Uh, parenteral dosing is effective at one to two micrograms every 12 hours. Uh, in intranasal, you have to use 10 times that much or 10 to 20 micrograms every eight to 12 hours. Uh, in oral, even though it works, you have to use 100 more times than parenteral or 100 to 200 micrograms every six to eight hours. Important, and why is that? That's because uh, DDAVP is still a peptide. The peptide is a protein and therefore it's destroyed by proteases in the GI tract. Uh, and you need to give 100 to 200 micrograms uh, just to be able to get one microgram across the gut epithelium and absorbed into the circulation. That's why the dosing is this high. Because it's destroyed by peptidases in the GI tract, best to treat with oral either before or two hours after meals uh, to try to decrease the amount of destruction in the GI tract and get a better absorption uh, uh, of the DDAVP.